Okay, good morning everybody. We're still waiting for a few more people to come on in. Um, sorry about the early hour for those of you on the West Coast. Um, trying to avoid conflicts, but I think we're going to end up pushing it to a later hour next time. Um, but we'll sort of see how this works out. It looks like everybody's still showing up, so that's good. Um, we're going to do a round of introductions once everybody gets here, but right now uh, I'm going to sort of go over the agenda, which is that we will be taking a look at a quick summary of what's being worked on right now, um, and then sort of go over the design requirements, uh, you know, sort of what needs to get done and what our short-term goal is, which is sort of by the end of, I guess, this coming month, September, um, we want to have a theoretically production deployable proof of concept. Um, that's a pretty aggressive goal. I'm not entirely sure, and it's going to be broken. I mean, it's not gonna be a test net, it's gonna be a broken net. But the goal is to solve most of the uh, most of the little integration problems and the operation problems and reach a point where people can really run uh, Peggy because, how should I put it? A lot of bridges are meant to be deployed once and they become quite complicated. Uh, but particularly for the Cosmos ecosystem, um, I wanna make sure that Peggy is easily deployable by everyone. Now. Um, obviously, once 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 IBC is out and matures, that's a bit less of a major concern. Um, but for now, um, I feel that it's important to ensure that multiple zones can easily deploy Peggy, um, even even if the eventual uh, long term sort of situation I see is that the ideal host for Peggy would be the Cosmos zone with the highest native token native staking token value, because that allows the highest amount of value stored in the bridge given our design, which would be the hub, um, obviously. So yeah, I think we've got most people here right now. Uh, if anybody wants to do introductions, feel free to just uh, go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Keep in mind, meeting is being recorded and will be posted to YouTube shortly after uh, we finish this. I just wanted to say hi. This is Deborah Simpier. I'm the CEO of Althea. Hi, everyone. Say a quick hello. It's Michael O'Rourke, uh, CEO of Pocket Network. And uh, we're looking into uh, doing some Ethereum stuff, so super keen on, on hearing the progress on this. Thanks, guys. This is Dean Tribble of Agoric. We're doing... Uh, DeFi Legos for that uh, connect through IBC to all the rest of Cosmos, and very interested in connecting to Althea or Peggy. <laughs> hey, this is Aki. Uh, I just think Peggy is one of the sort of more important initiatives right now. Um, and uh, put a lot of bunch of energy into trying to make sure it moves as quickly as possible. Hi there, uh, Alberto Hadardi of Pocket Network uh, and writer of uh, Dis Weekly. Uh, so I just want to listen, in, learn, learn more, and cover this in in my Infra uh, focused newsletter. Cool. Uh, I think that's everybody. Um, so, yeah, here we have sort of the sort of the checklist uh, that I wanted to try and go over today. And uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, go into a bit more detail about the structure, uh, technically of the implementation and what exactly is being worked on uh, than I did last week. Um, if you're interested in more high-level cooperation stuff, um, there are going to be other meeting. Um, there's another meeting about that Wednesday that I'm sure you'll find on our Twitter or whatever, where we sort of make the argument for why Peggy, why the hub, um, and those sorts of high-level questions. But right now, uh, we're going to dig right into the tech and the immediate goals um, and the real details of getting this done. 
Um, so I've mentioned this before, but a key part of the design for uh, Peggy is what we call the validator daemon. Um, and what that does is that it is a daemon process that runs on the validator. And that, let's see, so we got tests. Uh, so what it does is that it manages uh, the off-chain work of Ethereum signing, submitting, and monitoring Ethereum. So what I'm working on right now is specifically around synchronizing signing between the three different components of Peggy. Um, the uh, those components being the the those components being the relayer, the uh, well the the those components being the validator daemon, the Cosmos SDK uh, library you know Gaia itself, and then the Ethereum contract. Um, and this is rather tedious. Uh, this is this is sort of tedious signature work. Um, but it's important to get to sort of the next steps where we're implementing a lot of these flows. So the first flow that I am working on and currently the, uh, how should I put it? So this entire flow to create a validator set, update the validator state on Ethereum, and then submit transaction batches and uh, send funds back from Cosmos to Ethereum, as well as to receive funds from Ethereum to Cosmos, that's all implemented on the Solidity side up in the Solidity folder here. And you can run that fairly easily. Um, what I am working on now is integrating the rest of that with, um, it, sorry, is integrating this flow in the contract with Cosmos SDK and our, um, and our and our validator daemon forward slash relayer library, which is written in Rust. And um, right now I'm working on, so if we head over here, don't I have contact somewhere? Oh no, I must have must have overwritten that window. Um, so anyways, uh, contact is a, is a Rust library for talking to the RPC, um, for talking to the, for talking to the Cosmos uh, SDK RPC light client. Um, and what I've got so far here is flows for validator set requests. Um, so to take you through the process here, uh, this needs to go up one level. Okay, so to take you through the process here, um, a the the validator daemon process running on the validator sets an ethereum address for that validator uh, and they do this by sending message set eth address signed with the validator's funds holding key uh, on cosmos and then that sets an eth address in the store anybody can send this message including people who aren't validators but we only care about the validators um, this, yeah, and the handler validates that uh, that they signed the ETH address with their Cosmos key. Um, and then uh, somebody submits message val set request. And this is the first part of updating the validator set on Ethereum. Uh, somebody says, hey, I want to update the validator set on Ethereum. They send message val set request, which takes a snapshot of the validator set at the current block, at whatever block the message gets included in. Um, so now that it is in a block, uh, so now that we have a block defined and a validator set defined, uh, all of the all um, all of the validator daemons query this using uh, using val set request. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, that is a very bad naming. Anyway, so they request what the latest validator set is that they need to sign over. They verify it. They sign over it. Um, they don't really need to verify it since it is part of the consensus state in the chain. Uh, so their daemons sign over it with Ethereum. They submit this signature back to the chain. And now once again, this is in the store. It's just a message. Anybody can query it. It has its own little endpoint. Um, and now finally, somebody can 
grab all of these signatures, submit them to the Ethereum contract, and boom, you have updated the validator set on Ethereum. Um, and this flow is really just replicated. The process for moving transactions from Cosmos to Ethereum is the same concept, except it includes a state machine for handling the, the PEGI transaction pool, you know, transactions that are waiting to go across the bridge. For the deposit process, the Oracle is once again the same, except you observe Ethereum, and then you send a signed message saying, I saw this thing on Ethereum. And once you get enough signatures for that, uh, well, in this case, you don't need Ethereum signatures for this part of the process, but once more than 66% of the validators have said, hey, I saw an event on Ethereum, uh, you mint the coins. Uh, you mint the representation of the coins that have come across the bridge. So um, this is the really sort of foundational signing logic and in infrastructure, and it's kind of tedious, but it's something that needs to happen uh, because currently, so if we go over, oh no, I am in the right folder already. So if I go to the module folder and then X Peggy, um, let's see, where is this again? I sent it to Jahan just yesterday. Um, so essentially we need to take this, yeah, here. So this is message val set confirm. If we come, yeah, so message val set confirm is what you use to send a confirmed signature over a validator set. And if we go to the definition of this, which I don't have because I'm not in the right folder in, uh, I guess it's in messages, isn't it? Yeah, so we need a serialization definition for this, and then we need to replicate that serialization over in the contact library so that we can get it all signed and test this flow. Um, so that's sort of the very in the weeds, detailed interpretation of what am I working on right now. Uh, you can find Cosmos, uh, sorry, you can find contact on GitHub Althea net forward slash contact. Um, obviously the Peggy repo is uploaded to Obviously the, obviously the Peggy repo is on the Cosmos far slash Peggy GitHub. Um, and I keep it up to date with um, pretty much every day. Um, I try and push once a day uh, at least. So let's see, to sort of bring this all into the big picture. So right now we have a very, so to go from a very fine focus and kind of zoom out some. Uh, my goal is to get the validator set update process working, get it tested some, and then after that, to go and uh, to go and get the very basics of the transaction batch submission working, uh, and the very basics of the oracle, because all of those are just different message types. They use different parts of the same logic, um, and at that point, it should be viable to deploy what I want to call a broken net to indicate that uh, yes, we do expect it to pretty much break. Um, that will have the capability to move a single type of ERC-20 hard-coded at contract deployment time uh, back and forth. And I want to do that roughly by the end of this coming month because I believe that's a feasible design target. Uh, helps us find a lot of things. Um, helps us find a lot of problems. It's obviously not exceptionally usable in the production sense because if you have to hard-code a single type of ERC-20 token, you're not really, uh, well... It's not super useful, but it solves a lot of problems, namely around the fact that if you want to accept arbitrary tokens, uh, you've got to do significantly more store logic. Um, you also can't decide what the token is named because Ethereum addresses are slightly longer than uh, the maximum name length for a Cosmos token, uh, which presents you with a wonderful problem of either you truncate um, and hope you don't collide. You make a smaller hash and hope you don't collide. Or you accept the name of the ERC-20 token and hope nobody tries name collision there. Uh, I think the last is completely untenable. Um, the first one is what we probably want to do, just straight up truncation of the name. Um, but yeah, the point is to get something that is uh, theoretically deployable to production um, and usable and something that the public community can sort of get in on and try out. Um, but isn't really the final deal because I sort of want to take care of the 
you know, the sort of foundational practical problems that keep you from actually running the code first and get worried about theoretical slashing conditions, et cetera, et cetera, as we get closer to production. Um, speaking of theoretical slashing conditions, there's a pretty good discussion in the Peggy uh, Cosmos channel in Discord about exactly uh, about situations where consensus has broken and what that would mean for the bridge. Um, and this is this is sort of an interesting topic because when you normally because when you break consensus, uh, you know, let's say you have a validator that's 33% of the chain, and they suddenly leave or they fail. Well, the chain halts. And this normally isn't the end of the world because you can just get everybody together and restart the chain. It's a, it is bad, but uh, your money doesn't disappear. On the other hand, with Peggy, uh, in its current design, um, if you were to have a have a a validator with 33% of the stake to just simply disappear and never show up again. Um, you would actually lose the money in the bridge because it would remain locked. There wouldn't be enough multi-sig signers to get 66% um, and update the validator set. Um, so some sort of very minimalistic like client functionality may be required in the contract in order to break out of that condition. Um, but I would prefer to avoid working on those sorts of edge cases until we have something that you know, generally moves funds at all. It's easier to fix edge cases like that when you have something complete than to sit around and ponder how how you might fix them in a more generalized structure. Um, yeah, so I think that's most of what I wanted to go, let, let me go find my agenda. Yeah, so signing synchronization, relayer design, um, Oh yeah, so I should cover this again. Uh, so there's going to be two Rust binaries that come with Peggy. One of them will be the validator daemon, which the validators run, and will handle a lot of this uh, transaction batch logic and submission logic and observing the Ethereum blockchain. And the other will be a very simple traditional relayer that is designed to take the actual risk and perform the task of uh, paying for batches to be submitted uh, to Ethereum. And this is something of a, how should I put it? Um, since we're using transaction batches, uh, the cost of submitting a single batch, if it is efficient, is going to be you know, like an ETH or something big because you're submitting 100, 200 transactions at once. Um, so it is fairly costly. So there's going to be something of a market there for people who are willing to pay that money, and I want to make sure, uh, obviously you recover the amount in fees, but the fees are paid in the ERC-20 that you are relaying the batch for. So for example, if you have a batch of DAI transactions, you're going to get fees in DAI, and you're going to have to sell those to cover your costs in ETH. Um, and I want a relayer that does that automatically to hopefully avoid uh, I'm sure most of us have heard of the maker situation uh, that happened earlier this year where there was nobody running auction bots uh, because they were not robust enough and, well, various problems, and there were actually attacks designed to take down the auction bot as part of all of that. But um, I would like to design a very robust relayer as part of the default distribution of, of, uh, of Peggy to help uh, reduce that problem. Uh, and ensure that there is somebody always running a relayer willing to submit transaction batches, and we don't end up in some sort of uh, transaction batch fee stealing situation, which is another edge case to worry about. But in this case, it's a little easier to handle because you just have to actually publicly release a good relayer and make sure it's easy to run. Um, yeah, so I think that's everything that needs to be mentioned on my agenda. I'm, I'm not really sure how long these meetings should go in general. An hour is probably maybe a little bit too long if we don't have a lot of conversations to have, but uh, I don't know. So anyways, uh, I am open for any questions. And uh, yes, so um, I am happy to, happy to take questions, but more general questions along like uh, the larger plan of development for Peggy, funding for Peggy, well, sorry, deployment of Peggy to the, to the hub, uh, development of Peggy and funding for that sort of stuff. We'll be having another meeting Wednesday, which I don't quite remember the time of. So if you will forgive me and check 
my Twitter, which will actually have the correct time and details for the it's, Wednesday meeting. Uh, oh, oh, Deborah, do you have it? It's 11 a.m. Pacific time. Okay. Um, and that would be Wednesday, this, this, um, this coming Wednesday. And it's a YouTube live event. Um, and you can find out all the details on Twitter. Yeah. And that's going to have cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's going to have more of the, more of the like general details of like, what does it mean to deploy Peggy on the hub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right now I'm interested in comments on, you know, the technical design questions about flows or security risks. And, uh, you know, of course, if anybody is interested in contributing to any of this, um, it's not exceptionally complicated. It's just sort of tedious to implement. So feel free to ask whatever you need to get involved. Uh, specific host folks, maybe you're not quite awake yet. <laughs> uh, well, maybe. I get the feeling that a lot of people are uh, laying in bed with this meeting on their phones or something like that, which is something that I would I have admit no to idea what done. you're talking about. This <laughs> 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 is Dean. <laughs> so, I have a question. Um, uh, so, the, the, the two sides of connecting to it for a you know, sovereign Cosmos zone, whatever, is obviously connect over IBC to whatever chain is running it or run our own. What are the trade-offs? Okay. Yes, this is this is this is an excellent question. Um, so the trade-offs are that your validators are going to have to do a little bit more work to run Peggy. Uh, they need to have an Ethereum node that they trust um, because we solve a lot of the design security problems uh, that more complicated bridges have by simply saying that the validators are going to run their own daemon, which watches their own Ethereum node, and this can be a light client, um, that will give them, you know, sort of trustable RPC responses. And this solves a lot of the trust problems, but it is somewhat of a burden on the validators who will have to uh, make sure that they have a high quality Ethereum node in addition to a, um, you know, in addition to a high quality validator. And this is uh, this is problematic because Ethereum nodes suck like incredibly badly. If you've never run an Ethereum node in production and you've just kind of casually run one, you have no idea how bad they are. They give the wrong answers with wrong block heights. They stop synchronizing. They restart. They halt. They do weird crashes. They consume your disk space. They consume all your RAM um, in strange ways because somebody will send a transaction which will cause it to eat all of your RAM and crash. So it really is, um, even if you're running an ethereum light client, it is a non-trivial amount of trouble to manage running Peggy yourself in that sense, because your validators will have to do that. Um, and in a bad case where your validators do not do their required maintenance uh, and do not keep their, their, uh, their ETH node working, you could theoretically lose access to funds on the bridge. So let's say that nobody produces a validator set update in too long and more than 33% of the validator set has changed out, um, then that will result in an unrecoverable bridge. Now there can be slashing conditions to keep you from getting to that state in the first place. And we do plan for those. Um, but you know, there's, there's a certain amount of risk. And if your validator set is on its toes, um, the risk is not very high. If your validator set is very casual or doesn't really know what they're doing with an Ethereum node, risk may be somewhat higher. Um, then there's part two, and that is that uh, the that is that the bridge really is just a multi-sig for the validators. And if you don't trust your validators, or how should I put it? And if your validators have less at stake than there are funds in the bridge, you are in trouble because they can just run off with the funds in the bridge and uh, that's an issue. Um, there's also theoretically some issues around what happens uh, if you have very large validators with a very large portion of delegated funds um, because you're slashing them uh, because that changes the ratios. So let's say for example you have a validator with 33% but only 1% of it is their own stake and the other 32% is delegated to them. 
um, what they have at stake is actually significantly less than uh, than the value of the funds in the bridge, even though technically the total amount of stake they control is greater than the value of the funds in the bridge. So you get, in, um, as a note, the only thing a validator with 33% of the stake could do is hold the bridge hostage. They couldn't actually move the funds. You need 66% for that, just like you need it to take over the chain. Um, so these are sort of the complexities and risks that you could mitigate by going over IBC. Um, and especially if you have a really solid validator set with a really large amount of staked value, you can end up in a situation where these aren't big restrictions um, for you. They'll still be something of a problem for the validators running Peggy. Um, the going over the bridge, that assumes that the zone at the other end has, I mean, it has all the same issues, right? So, so... Um, if you're going over the over IBC to the Cosmos Hub, and that's where uh, Peggy is run, there's still the same issue of validators there having little at stake in comparison to what they have staked, right? Yeah, um, that's uh, that's still something of an issue, and I think it can be most mostly ameliorated by. Um, with like one or two sort of like client style features for specific slashing conditions and bridge rescue. Um, because even though the hub does have validators with, you know, a significant amount delegated compared to their stake, it doesn't actually have uh, that many of them. You know, nobody has 33% stake. Uh, and it's as long as nobody. Uh, so as long as no one validator has more than 33% and you're getting into like Tindermint failure territory, uh, Peggy will always work so long as Tindermint itself doesn't have a failure. The problem is that Peggy is less recover is currently, and I believe we can fix this, is currently less recoverable after a Tindermint failure than a normal chain would be. Um, but if you can avoid a Tindermint, uh, um, if you can avoid a Tindermint failure, you're safe. So the more diverse the validator set is, the safer the bridge is. And this is one of the reasons why we spent as much time as we did trying to make sure that the Ethereum contract could handle uh, a, 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 a full-sized validator set. Because all of these problems are amplified with smaller peg zones. Got it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Michael. Cool. Okay, so we're coming hey, up. Mm -hmm. Justin, quick question. Yeah. Morning. Quick question, Tarek here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think back to Dean's point. Dean mentioned in the um, Telegram um, what thoughts and plans we have for security and audit testing for Peggy. Um, did you cover like you know what type of um, you know, when you think of auditing and possibly testing some of these assumptions, um, what we might look at in the future. Um, are there any of those that, you know, would speak to the, you know, validator set security or um, is that something that uh, currently, at least from where we've talked, we've already covered? Um, so as far as testing security assumptions, I would really like to um, have enough funds to do a incentivized testnet that's reasonably sizable. Um, at, at, at the same time, um, I would like to get the code to a point where it is more written and we know its restrictions before we, we really start planning in too much detail where or how uh, we want to audit and in what detail. Um, because, you know, obviously the Ethereum contract needs some level of auditing. Um, but it's fairly straightforward. You know, it's just a multi-sig for the validators. The game theory assumptions, uh, they're probably going to require a some inspection, but our goal was to minimize the edge cases as much as possible. Um, so I think that by the end of our implementation, we'll have a few edge cases, a few mitigation strategies, and we'll want to run an incentivized testnet 
and probably bring in some experts to review key hotspots before it really gets deployed to large scale production. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, I would rather vulnerabilities that are in front of me than vulnerabilities that are unknown. So I'm always hesitant to add too much, uh, too many like fancy cases, you know, because you're tempted to say, oh, look, if we do this fancy light, light client signing this way, we can solve this case. Or if we do this fancy thing, we can solve this. I would really rather have a known security issue that's well defined than implement a lot of complicated code in Solidity or a lot of complicated uh, game theory over on the Cosmos side and have it blow up in my face in unexpected ways. Um, so I think that's a sort of a short summary in that we're probably going to want to run an incentivized test net before, somebody, before anybody puts a million dollars in this and have some level of an audit. At the same time, I am going to prioritize simple solutions with known problems with like, you know, if you have a validator with more than 33%, that's going to be an issue. I would much rather just have that in plain text than to have a scenario where things go wrong. That is unexpected, I should say. Got it. Thanks. Cool. Um, so do we have any other questions? And uh, Michael, I believe you're a little bit uh, coming in towards the end here. Uh, but this will be on YouTube in just an hour or so, or whenever YouTube finishes processing the video, which is normally not as fast as I would like. But my complaints aside, it will be available. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, uh, we're coming up on the half hour. Well, we're a little past the half hour, and I think that's everything, unless somebody else has another question. Cool. Thank you all very much for coming, and uh, I look forward to talking to you um, two weeks from now, which would be... Justin, question. Oh, well, sure. You know, you're, talking to us on Wednesday. you're talking to us on Wednesday, too. Oh, well, yes, yes. Before yes. this, um, <laughs> do, do, are we going to have a recording of this we can share um, yes, with yes. folks across Cosmos? Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm just about to go over and hit the stop recording button over in OBS. Um, <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Thank you, everybody, for attending.